Space, and welcome to our panel on Wither Spaceflight. Mm. And the first thing I get to do is uh, I get to ask our esteemed panel just to give us a brief introduction of themselves, and we'll take things from there. Oh, sorry. Okay. Is that done? Good. David. I'm not really this small, I'm sitting on a chair in there. <laughs> well, you've already been introduced to me, really, via the, the uh, preamble, haven't you? And, uh, if you'd like to know all about it, you just come to my talk this afternoon. <laughs> you didn't play the door, really. uh, I'm Una McCormack, I'm a recovering sociologist. I'm now a lecturer in creative writing, and I write Star Trek and Doctor Who novels. Um, and I'm uh, Graham Slight. I'm um, the well, former editor of Foundation, one of the editors of the uh, Science Fiction Encyclopedia, written about SF for um, various places, including Locus, um, Washington Post, and so on. And um, yeah, very pleased to be here. So, humanity's long dreamed about space flight, be it to the moon or to other planets in the system. Do you think? Start at the beginning. Do you, do you think that humanity is even going to go back to the moon again? Or not? And why, why would they do that? Or why not? Is the case maybe? Well, there's quite a debate, debate going on, of course, inside and outside NASA, whether she goes to the moon or Mars. Buzz Aldrin, the second man to walk on the moon, he's uh, completely in favour of us going to Mars next. And we've been to the moon, done that, that's pretty sure, you know. Um, there are very good reasons, I think, for going to the moon first, because we can use it. It's in our backyard, I thought we'd get there in a couple of days, where it might take a month. And we can use um, the moon as a testing ground for all sorts of things that we do on Mars. Okay, it's got less, a lower gravity, it's got even less atmosphere, or no atmosphere than Mars, but nonetheless, it was still making an interesting proving ground for all the things we want to do when we do go to Mars. So that's why, personally, I think the moon uh, is the place to be interested in. Of course, China, India, Japan, other countries have also made noise about it. They're going to the moon and going to Mars, so we could have another space race, it's hope, anyway. But, uh, yeah. um, I, I'd say Mars. I, I think that, that almost certainly, I will, if Buzz Aldrin says it, I, I listen to experts. Really? <laughs> um, but so I think that um, what you have to do is win public imagination because that gets consensus behind spending money, putting money into these projects. And I think Mars has that chance of capturing imagination, but as David said, uh, we've done the moon, take that one off. Um, and I think that the stories that we see that people are telling each other about where can we go next, what's the next challenge, what's the next frontier, are about Mars. They're, I mean, the Martian has just been tremendously successful. So I think that is what will capture public imagination. And um, if that is captured, then I think the money follows. And uh, Mars, I think. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the why here is the really important mm -hmm. thing, isn't it? Why do this, as opposed to any of the other bunch of things that we could be doing mm -hmm. as, a, as a species, say, to be, to be grand about it? You know, there are other things on, potentially on the to-do list. Mm -hmm. Climate change, income inequity, um, you know, preventing our incipient descent into this token healthcare. It's not <laughs> um, you know, concentrating on one thing inevitably means not concentrating on others. And so, you know, I'm as, you know, as, as much as anyone here, I'm sure I, I have the sort of formative experiences of, of watching science fiction, reading science fiction, seeing illustrations like David's and Pip Waterfall, you know, Chester Bonstor or whoever, and thinking, okay, that's mm -hmm. the next thing. But I think making the case for why that's the next thing, as opposed to everything else, is, is not a trivial question. I completely agree. And that, uh, that, that people look around and practically see, but uh, there are food banks, there are issues here, there's displacement, there's poverty, there's climate change. And you're talking about spending a load of money sending a rocket. Yeah. I think that's absolutely right. And that, I suppose, is why I would say Mars could capture in that yeah. way. Although, of course, uh, simply sending people up to the International Space Station is doing that. Yeah. Um, Absolutely. Tim Finkel, who must be interested when he was uh, going into the space, and then, of course, he has to go to 
coming back as well. So and coming back to uh, um, Hadfield as well. Yeah. Uh, very much so. But don't, don't you think it's a good idea to walk before we run? And we, okay, we've been to the moon, but it was 1972 when we last <laughs> left there. Um, so wouldn't it be a good idea to at least sort of get, get, get used to the idea of men going to the boat? And, and there are things on the moon. There's, there's water near the poles, we know that now. There's, there's helium-3 to be uh, mined from the moon if you want to make it really useful. Um, so I, I quite agree that Mars is the place that really inspires our imagination. We all would like us to see humans on Mars and put the ball to the Martian in the film, wouldn't we? <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, I think possibly it would be a good idea still to use the moon, the moon as, a, as a test bed first. Yeah. Do you feel that going back to the moon is um, it's a way of maturing the technologies and as much as the, how I put it, the sort of intellectual conversation and discourse around space travel, would that condition people into accepting manned space flight to other planets more easily than going directly to Mars? That's a complex question, but you see what I mean. Can, I, can, I, can, I, can I be a politician and answer that by not answering it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is to say, one of the things I was going to say, is the formative event for me, is, you know, when I was growing up and thinking about space travel, was being at school one day and all the classes getting called into the assembly hall, um, you know, the new footage of the Challenger disaster. Mm -hmm. And the sense that that conveys that this is actually something really, really difficult to do. That it's really, really challenging. And despite having the best engineers, the best technical teams, whatever, it is, it is, it is difficult to do. Mm -hmm. and, and, and I think one of the things that struck me in the last couple of years, and it speaks to both the, the, the thing with Tim, Tim Heath and, and, and um, Chris Hadfield and so on, is that the people running our, the operations that, that there are in space have been very consciously and visibly oriented towards what is the public face for us. Mm -hmm. Giving people a public face that seems attractive and, and, and makes, makes the case for it. And so, to actually get back to answering your question, um, I think there's certainly an argument that you know if you if you went to the moon and you got some nice carefully thought through footage and imagery out of it, it could it could help build 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 the case. If if you see that as a as a valid use of, of doing it. And and the, the, the other question that I suppose is a challenge back is other than you know what they've done on Twitter or what what they've done on, on uh, you know playing Space Odyssey or whatever, who, how many people could actually say what the people on the, on the, on the International Space Station or whatever have done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that's a difficult challenge, isn't it? Um, and the IS is in all by itself, what is it there for? Mm -hmm. Apart from being a very expensive way of um, spending money. Yeah. 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 I don't know what, what you've got to feel about that. Is there a point of having an IS at all? I guess I suppose I would think it's it's uh, keeping in mind, uh, just thinking from a from a public point of, facing point of view, it's keeping in mind the possibility that we could leave this planet, explore, go further, exploit resources from other places, just go along for a ride. Um, so it is doing that good work. You are quite right, but I have no idea what uh, what scientific experiments that they're doing. I suspect if you went into some classrooms, however. Yeah. Uh, a seven-year-old could probably sit here and go, well, they were doing the thing with the thing, and that means that the thing was doing the thing. But uh, no, I, I wouldn't yeah. have any idea. So for me, it's a sense of a, uh, uh, yeah. it's still laying out. It's like we've, we've still got some of the rail track down. Or, or, or it's keep broadcasting the pilot episode until someone wanted to take it serious. Yes, yes. that's a very good way of thinking about it, yeah. The thing is, we need to send writers and artists into space, don't we? Which, well, mm. they haven't really done. I mean, okay, uh, uh, Alex Leonov is an artist, in actual fact, and so is Alan Bean, but I mean, they just happen to be artists as well as astronauts. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, the Apollo, it really lost the public interest very quickly because it just went like clockwork, and all the astronauts had been trained, and everything they did, everything they'd been trained to do, they did, and it, was just, it just became boring, basically, to the rest of the public. Yeah. So, what we need is somebody who can really give us some inspiration, and, and I think the only way to do that really is to send some people who can write, maybe poetry. I'll get behind this. They should send us. Yeah. <laughs> they should send artists and writers into space. Yeah. 
it's not a bad idea. <coughs> there are programs that you uh, you know you can you can be the writer or the artist or the musician in residence at Antarctic bases, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. They're pretty hostile environments, and they're pretty well controlled where you are. Um, but um, I, I guess the risk of that is exactly the risk of what happens on Challenger, where a school teacher is sent up. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but then, as you say, that brings down the message that this is not a safe. It, it's mm -hmm. it's not. Uh, catching the bus, it's not uh, having a train, it's doing something difficult, mm. doing something dangerous, mm. but something that is worthwhile. But yeah, <coughs> that would be wonderful. But actually, NASA did have an artist program years ago, I, I've known my, my name down on it, mm. uh, to go on the shuttle, but then unfortunately Challenger came along and everything just... Uh, exactly, yeah. yeah. I mean, just in parenthesis, I'm just looking at these... Are these your images, David? Or are there no, 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 no. One of the things that's really striking to me this is just me, about, but about a number of these images is, is the fonts. A lot of these, these slides that we're seeing up here, the, the, the fonts and, and, and the way it's presented, feel kind of nostalgic. Yeah. Feel kind of, some of them that went by earlier were kind of art, art deco -y, um, you know, the grand tour, of course, is, you know, a, yeah. a centuries or two ago, the original notion about, about trekking around Europe. And uh, I'm... To think that I'm, travel to space is, a, is something we are nostalgic about. It's extraordinary. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's not future faces. These are all old mental places. Is that right, Chair? Um, <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, it's fantastic. It's great thing about narratives and the way that mm -hmm. we are. One of the things that fascinates me is the way that the various narratives, as um, supported by uh, different nationalities, have changed over the years. So, for example, the American uh, narrative in the 60s was very much space as the new frontier. Yeah. In Russia, it's very different. It's positive. Uh, it's a completely different mindset. And I wonder how, how that has changed. And how can that be? What is the narrative now? And how can we shape that, do you think? Um, or is there one? Is there an, is there an, uh, an accessible one? The narratives that enthralled me as a child were actually about normalisation, um, in a way that you, you, you walked into. So the sort of books that I was reading as a, as a kid that excited me were, it's accepted, oh, I think of, um, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, blanking my type of the Arthur C. Clarke uh, story where he wins a prize to go to uh, near space orbit. And it was a, it'll come to us. It was a normalisation of that. It was a, a thing we could do. You know, we, it says like Islands in the Sky. That's, it, that's exactly. what it is, Islands in the Sky. Thank you very much. And so it, was, it wasn't adventure. I didn't come for that. It was, I didn't come for that. Did you? I'm the best I've ever done. Well, it enchanted me. Um, so, normalisation. This is a thing that we do. It wasn't adventure. It's something that we do every day. Mm. Catch a, you know, I'm amazed I can get from London to Liverpool in two and a quarter hours. I mean, that's incredible. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, but we can. So, making it more than that. Yeah, I mean, I guess if it, I, and I sort of ran across this, I guess, in the, the Patrick Moore books that one found a ton of in public library. But just to take one example of, I think, a really good story where it's normalised. Does anyone know Griffin's Egg? Michael Swanwick, short novel from 1991, too, where the moon has been not merely been to, but essentially industrialised and set. And it's not a terribly optimistic world because it's, it's also been to an extent strip mined. And you know, there are the, the great uh, rails almost of, of, of rubble running alongside the road, roads where, where, where you get past. But that is one version, and, and I'm sure there are others. Kim Stanley Robinson's Master of the very obvious example of taking this as, taking the journey and getting there as, as the least interesting bit, mm. and taking what is life like there. Almost the normal yeah. science, yeah. in a way, yeah. not, not, the, not the adventure, yeah. not the, as you say, the, the, the journey, but the, the living with it day yeah. by day, and what that impact would be. And I suppose, just to pick up on that distinction, if you go back to that narrative Bill was describing of, of, of um, New Frontier, you probably, in science fiction, have to go back home. You probably have to go back to particularly those stories in the past through tomorrow and the Heinlein version of things where an individual with vision goes out and, and makes makes a thing happen. Um, and there's always been, I, I think, a tension in, in American SF and the stuff that's grown around it of 
is this a thing for government to do, or is this, you know, are we just going to watch Elon Musk do it, and, and, and um, we will all, um, you know, the, the uh, what's the Jones in his, probably <laughs> utopian future. <laughs> This makes the Martian quite interesting, I suppose, because yeah. it, is, it is normal in a way. Uh, I mean, you're getting this adventure story, and a, a man struggling to you know, survive, so it's a, a very much a sort of individual process. Story. But the, the, the stuff that he's doing is normalised, I suppose. It's in extraordinary circumstances, but it is normalised. And at uh, the, the um, film of Apollo 13 mm. as well, the most exciting bits are, can we make the square thing round, and you know, how do we problem solve them? So, uh, yeah. uh, yeah. Ben Boger actually, of course, also wrote another book um, which depends upon sort of rich industrialists to make things happen. Yeah. And that's, that's what we're working for. So, Super Richard Branson stepped further, you know, not, not just talking about space crime, but actually, but uh, that's a trouble. I mean, the governments, obviously, they can't afford to do it. And uh, that's one of the things that happens, I guess, with this, you know, some sort of interest. Mm. I think there's two things. One is the way in which the technology matures, it gets cheaper, and it becomes a little bit more accessible that way. Also, it's in the way that governments organise together, do a much more collaborative approach. But quite how you resolve that tension between the individual and uh, the governmental, I don't know. I don't, I don't know how that's going to evolve either. <laughs> there's, there, there, there's a whole other thing that we could go off into here, I'm sure, about wither the government and wither nation states. And, you know, mm -hmm. Governments have a ton of other things on their plate. States are maybe less less powerful than they used to be, um, and, and you know, they they may think that apart from the stuff that directly bears on them, and I think what happens in you know near to earth is probably a separate conversation. Um, you know, the degree to which the satellite world is part of the the, the sort of panopticon is what you know the all of us. Um, you know, if, if I was making policy that kind of thing, well, let the private sector do it, as as as, as governments often as often governments do, for better or for worse. You know, sounds dangerous, well. sounds risky, yeah. sounds expensive, sounds very long term. Doesn't affect many voters. Yeah, exactly. Within my five-year time horizon, yeah. or within my constituency. Yeah. Yeah. And what if you're someone like China? Do we think then that economics or econ what economic drivers do, do we see about driving space exploration forward? Be it humans on Mars or, or mining asteroid belts or anything we think about that. Is that going to happen? Do we see that happening? Uh, there's a big word Brexit hanging over there. I'll say it so that you don't have to. You really thought they hit us on the board. Yeah, had to. I mean, I, I, who, who knows? Who knows? Um, I mean, I suppose one version of the case for this is the case that, that set out in, in the Mars trilogy, which is that you go to Mars and you colonize it, you shape it more towards a human scale and a human environment in response to the, the pressures back here and, and, and as a survival. That, that that population and demographics and climate and everything will at some point over the next 150, 200 years conspire to make you know, all sorts of awful Malthusian things happen here unless we do something else. So, you know, there's a, a broader topic here, I guess, of science fiction, writing, film to an extent, and science fiction <coughs> art as a kind of advocacy, yeah. Yeah. as not merely telling a story, but, but, but as to say, this is good for us to do as a species, and here's why. Mm. And here's what it would look like. Well, I'm going to say that, mind you, um, there are parts of the Earth that we could, ter we could terraform much more easily than, than we could terraform the moon or Mars or the mm. other planet. Mm. Uh, there's an awful lot we could do on the Earth if you've got to just spend some money and uh, start looking for research and doing it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, This goes up to uh, what you're saying about narrative and uh, driving things forward. How do we see science fiction evolving and the, its relationship between fiction and reality, that, that sort of symbiosis between the two? How do we 
we see that report, they will change it. <coughs> um, well, what the first thing we're taking as an active, which we should maybe, and it means not to anyone, we should maybe question that science fiction is in the business of, of, of prediction or advocacy or whatever. And uh, Ursula Gwynn, to take one example, has talked very eloquently about, about the idea of something like the left hand of darkness not being at all interested in this is what the universe is like. Mm -hmm. She wanted to tell a story of a particular form. It happened to be the best way to do it, to do it on a planet where, where the species that live there have certain characteristics. So let's you know, stipulate to, to, to start off with that this is a subset of what science fiction does. Um, I get um, review copies for science fiction process. Mm -hmm. And the list that Jeff Wilmot sends me, it's a huge long list, it's long, you know, it's just called down in the computer. Um, whittling out a science fiction story from all the fantasy and series and spin up from movies and television and gaming and everything else. It, it, science fiction is, is that much out of that much, you know, really, no doubt. It's, 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 uh, it's uh, what we do need is to get some sort of new kind of science fiction that, uh, that expands the horizon much more. It feels kind of embarrassing we've not mentioned particularly Steve Baxter here. And him as, as an obvious heir to, to a particular, mostly British tradition of scientific romance and science fiction as a, as a venue for observing the universe and rather than owning it. Um, and, and, you know, I think you can find it in the body of work that he's created, a, a particular, uh, particularly pure version. Well, it's got those that get into different areas. It's a lot of exploration, a lot of ownership, a lot of exploitation. Yeah. Um, but then, which, where do we see that going? going so, it's a tough question, I know it is. Uh, if I knew, I'd, I'd pitch it to the publisher. <laughs> uh, the, kind, the kind of science fiction that I write is, is not even remotely that. I'm sure some people would, would, would not even call it science fiction, but it's about, it's entirely in a tradition of um, uh, projecting one's contemporary fears onto a sort of empty space uh, and, uh, and, and trying to work through solutions for yeah. human problems, human social problems. Onto that space. Uh, that's what Star Trek is about. Um, Doctor Who too, a bit yeah. similar. So, and that's the kind of thing I want. So, yeah. Yeah. And I don't know, for instance, how much Liz would, in terms of her work, think of it as predictive. It's not remotely predictive. Versus, no. this is a landscape, or this is a kind of society, or this is a, a world view I'm interested in, in describing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, pr it's primarily it's going to be entertaining. Um, and I think. Um, if, if message fiction does not work particularly well, um, thought experiment fiction does work very well in this sort of environment. Um, but I'm interested in doing a whole lot of other stuff on top of that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's not remotely predictive, and science fiction is very good in my opinion at being predictive. Although I think it can be causative. Yes. In that I think a lot of people read William Gibson's Neuromancer and thought, well, this would be really cool if we could do this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the Met has partly emerged in response to people reading that. So I think we ought to be looking at the causal relationship, not a And consciously as well, I think. Yeah, yeah, there are people who've gone, that was so brilliant on Star yeah. Trek. I want yeah. to live in a Star Trek world. Yeah. And, and, and you know, I want to put the bar somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, they now have that scanner, don't they? Maybe it's um, something close to it. There's a lovely bit in Deep Space Nine where um, uh, Benjamin Sisko has about seven iPads in front of him for each different file he's reading. <laughs> yeah. Well, just off the wall. Well, you know, equally, what is the functional difference between having Wikipedia on your phone and Hitchhiker's Guide? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Um, except that, you know, Hitchhiker's Guide is more reliable and more funny. This is quite, quite a good time to bring you out to the floor. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, it started off with me talking about, should we go to the moon or Mars? Given that the attention span of most people nowadays is much shorter than it used to be, the moon, which we can do in there and back in a fortnight kind of thing, or Mars, which we can do in whatever it is, two years, 
Uh, don't you think that to get public on your side, which is one thing we probably do need, is the boom will be a better shot purely to keep yeah. people involved? Yeah, but it'd be very difficult to get people interested in the vast machine when all they're doing is sitting there and getting a few and there's nothing much happening around there. Well, I, guess, uh, I guess I would say in that case you need a really good showrunner. Um, yes. So this, you're, you're right. I mean, we joked about this, but um, I'm, I, I'm thinking of the um, the last two seasons of the West Wing, which uh, uh, some people sort of tongue in cheek suggest were a kind of testing ground for can we plausibly have an, a narrative about Obama? Uh, and uh, people did get caught up in that narrative of, of electing Santos. And uh, as it was being transmitted, I mean, I know we all sort of Netflix it and you know read the box set, watch the box set in a short period of time. So I guess you would, I, I guess if I was show running Mission to Mars, I would have a oh, selection process as season one and then to, to kind of construct that into what that mission would involve. It sounds very cynical, but there will be cycles in the project that you can interest people in. Yeah. And maybe, maybe there's a, a prequel series called Return to Moon or something <laughs> like that. Yeah. that. That's what my kind yeah. of uh, wicked <laughs> brain would instruct. I mean, I think to, 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 to nab a word from John Clute, mm -hmm. uh, not his, his originally, but what, one of the problems here, of course, is it's not a story. That, that the yeah. business of you know, sitting on a train for two years, as it were, mm -hmm. is not actually yeah. t terribly, terribly interesting. And, you know, it, it makes it easier for our brains if, if the, mm -hmm. the thing is story shaped, I suppose. Yeah. And, very similar problem, actually, I think a more acute problem in um, selling policies about climate change. Yeah. Because the effects of that are so incremental. Yeah. And the solutions to it will only be so incremental, you know, they may even not be graspable in a human lifetime. Mm. How do you. And the catastrophe it? seems so unmanageable yeah. that you just go, I won't think about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I, I think if you're going to want to present something to the public, one way or another, you need to do so in a way that's not just a, a clock counting down from 700 days. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, because I had thought about making it kind of reality show, like Big Brother. If you think about Big yeah. Brother, that is essentially just 10 people sitting in quite a big shed uh, in the middle of London. And um, the way that they sort of like um, storify that mm. is to whip up tension. <laughs> so I'm thinking, it, why do you think if, if you did get private investment in this kind of reality show about Mission to Mars, things could go horribly wrong? What would be the. Do you think they need to release the squints into the evictions would be. God, I hope <laughs> One sees all sorts of, you know, particularly SF films, where you say, how on earth did whatever HR was in this world decide to put these six psychopaths in this one time? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, You're asking this about HR. No, I'm asking this about Torchwood season one. Right. Separate question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've not read a Torchwood, no. No, no, no. It's all right. I'll take it on the chin. I think it's a question for me with the, with the, with the psychology of the world. Um, sticking six or ten people in a box. I think it could be interesting if you could gamify the scientific experiments mm -hmm. um, on board and then you'd have quite a few that you could do en route to, to yeah. Mars and uh, that could create interest, you know, as well as obviously the science that comes out of it to try to either gamify it, teamify it between the, 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 the crew half and half and then you get, I, I don't know, and then the social media uh, that is generated from that will create interest. Yeah, and I suppose to go back all to Roger's question, um, and, and something we were talking about earlier, there is something like a model for this that you could try out now, which is making what we do scientifically in the Antarctic mm. more mm. prominent, more public access. Because, mm. you know, a lot of commonalities in the environment, you're not quite locked in a box for, for a couple of years, but, but it's... A it, few months, it, yeah. You know, and I think it's probably not an accident that, you know, Stan Robinson's Antarctic has so much in common with, with, with the last one. Um, 
Yeah, just to go, well, may, may I kind of just touched on what, what I um, wanted to uh, say, which was uh, um, coming on from you know, David's original point about uh, uh, sending lighters into space. Um, obviously, Clark does that quite a lot, I think. Um, Craig into space, I think it's actually a historian rather than a creative writer, but it's the same sort of. Uh, um, basis, and uh, um, I think you know, Stan Robinson was a, a recipient of one of these Antarctic grants, and uh, and uh, I think I think quite deliberately used that as a, uh, as a way of saying, yeah, now I've done the Mars thing. Yeah, this is what we can learn from writing about Mars, and this is what we can learn from writing about Antarctica to transpose back into the space program. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure that was pretty. Deliberate. Um, the other thing I wanted to, to, to mention was the, the these nostalgic sort of fonts that uh, and, and, and pictures that Graham um, yeah, pointed out, which are kind of you know like those old-fashioned railway thing. Go to go to Skegness and hate racing. You know, go to Mars. It's really racing. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, 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 I was thinking actually thinking about that recently. And it, and it, uh, and it's kind of a double-edged sort of um, um, uh, sword on in, in, in propaganda because I was also thinking of the um, um, bit in Space Merchants where they're very much marketing Venus, which is, mm. yeah, is all horrible and hostile, but they want to market it as cosy, and so they produce this uh, um, uh, advert about you know how great it will be once we take on Mars. It ends with this. Um, uh, uh, with this kid saying, Mummy, uh, uh, when I grow up, can I take my kids to a place as nice as Venus? <laughs> um, uh, uh, and, 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 and I kind of wonder whether, whether sort of cozying it um, uh, might be a little bit counterproductive and, uh, uh, and whether and we go back to Antarctica now romanticising the adventure um, uh, and, and stressing the difficulty. Settlements of Montana, and uh, a lot of that was uh, uh, how people were persuaded to go out. Right. You know, to get your own bit of land out in Montana, well, it's, it's a piece of very, very, very thin soil. Um, and uh, I, I think you're right uh, that, that it would fall into the same trap. And that cozying it, I suppose, is part of that process of normalisation. But um, some some places you just can't be comfortable. Yeah. Um, it's notable that the most successful, I think the most successful films about exploring the solar system in recent years have both been about things horribly going wrong, uh, which is Gravity and The Martian. And in both of them, you've got one person sort of horribly trapped and everybody else is, is sort of dead or, or panicking or whatever. Mm. And uh, it's not setting an ideal... It's not sitting the scene ideally for, for going ahead with space colonisation, is it? Or space exploration. But I, I suppose this goes back to the point I was, I was trying to argue earlier around making things story shaped. Mm. That, that, you know, you're doing something, a problem comes up, you find a solution after difficulties. It's, it's the classic shape for, for a story. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and Apollo. Far more people would go and see Apollo 13 than Apollo 14. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what happened, isn't it? I mean, it, there was a lot of interest, in obviously, in Apollo 11 being the first. In 12, they lost lots of interest, and other being turned camera on the sun and burning out. That didn't go at all, mm. so we had no pictures. And then 13 came along, and of course, the interest rose enormously. Mm.
groups are doing, I suppose, isn't it? That we're, uh, we're watching. Uh, he's, I, mean, I know he's Canadian, but he's a sort of old American hero, really. Uh, have, I've forgotten his name, but Chris had Chris, Chris yeah, yeah. Um, There's something very poised, very calm, very, you know, I'm sure he's like a triathlete and married to high school sweets at heart or something. There's something very archetypal about him. I think of him and I think of that, that airline pilot who landed that plane of the mm. river. There's something that you, uh, you, you know, there's something very yeah. calming. And I guess he's 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 immensely influential in the, I saw him at the Sibley on Birmingham. Um, well, no, tonight, as a matter of fact, I said, the planet, the planet suite performed it. So. And he actually he filled the Sibley Hall. One man on the stage, he okay, got a big screen behind him and showed video and stuff on the screen, but one man held that audience for an hour and went, have a lovely welcome for an hour and a half, I wasn't sure. And um, he just had it in the palm of his hand. He finished off because he's five singing space like this. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. but, but I mean, there is a tradition in science fiction of the characters being kind of hollowed out viewpoints. Yeah. And the time traveller in Wells, or, you know, how much can you remember that's characteristic about the, the characters in 2001? They are there, you know, Paolo is the most memorable character in 2001. The, the, the humans are there to, to view the things that they're there to view. Yeah, um, the Martians. I suppose if you think about story shaping, then if you if you if you push character forward and you turn it into some of a soap opera, then in a way what you will lose then is the emphasis on the uniqueness of the of the setting. That the setting has to be easy to understand in some way. Yeah. Uh, we're in a different story. Yeah. Um, the, the one example that springs to mind is an interesting hybrid on this to my mind, which is the movie of content. The movie rather more than the book, um, because I think they were making really, really strenuous efforts there mm. to create in your Jodie Foster character someone who had, you know, family drivers, things about her that made her want to do this particular thing, yes. that made her really upset when at least initially it seemed she can't, and yet at the end she winds up saying, "I can't really do this. They should have sent a poet." Yeah. Um, and, and she, despite the best efforts of the first half of that film, mm -hmm. is kind of reduced again to just looking at the CGI that's around her. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Oh, it's me. Good. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to do a little plug, um, since I'm actually doing a poetry project for a mission called Winter Mission One, and they're actually sending like an archive, a digital archive of art that I 
mean, obviously, you know, at the moment, as a couple of these have said, we are in, these couple of years, we're in an absolutely astonishing age of discovering better planets. Mm. And I'm sure that's going to continue, and I'm sure we will find a bunch of stuff that there, there that is, is, is really, really interesting. I have exactly no formal qualifications to say this, but my, my own personal answer to Fermi Barrowlands is that there's life out there but that travel between star systems is just so structurally difficult that it's almost impossible to do. Um, and so I don't, I don't know, um, but I think it's, it's, it's a very, it's a really, really difficult thing, even compared to all the difficult things we, 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 we talked about today. Which is to say, as Mr. Zinn said, it would be great. I, I think I'd, I'd like I'm, I'm John Davis, I'm from uh, the Institute for Interstellar Studies, and naturally, of course, I'm, I'm going to disagree with you. Uh, you should look, perhaps, at Project Starshot. Uh, you're really on a breakthrough initiative for, for a, a, a nano spacecraft, um, later published. Um, and some of the stuff we in Upper IS are doing as well, which is some of it's along the same lines. But certainly, it, it looks distinctly feasible to send very small spacecraft to the nearest star in periods of uh, decades. In other words, the length of the current Voyager mission is already accomplished. So it is distinctly feasible. Man did a so sort of what of fraction of the speed of light? At, at things like 10%, that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, laser push. Mm -hmm. And there are also, of course, uh, fusion craft uh, uh, as well, but that's, that's much bigger in, ter in terms of, of, of the engineering requirements. So that it is, it is within a feasible technology within the next few decades. Uh, that, that is almost certainly the case. You would have Stephen Hawking and, uh, and, uh, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg on board on the, on the Starship project if it, if it wasn't looking reasonably realistic. Um, I suppose my, my only other thing, and, and sorry, keep coming coming back to it, but and it's not quite quite what you talked about, but recent novel that really really is interesting on this is Aurora. Kim Stanley Robinson's last year about the practicalities of what the generation starship fit for travelling between stars. Mm -hmm. Yes, he's pessimistic, certainly. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I think we'll